Ding, 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 ding. Who is cinema's greatest secret agent? Is it Bond, Bourne, or Ethan Hunt? We've got to stop Ethan Hunt. What? It's insane. That baffled me for years. I wanted to fight a bear. Then we'll see if Tom Cruise is really as tough as he says. Hello and welcome to The Screen Test. My name's Jack Howard. I'm here with Clarice Lockery and Joe Kinwin as What's usual. Good? And this week we've got a new recruit in the form of author and film journalist, Helen O'Hara. Hello. Michael B. Jordan has taken on the King of Wakanda. He's gone toe to toe with Ivan Drago's son, but now in his new film, Without Remorse, he's facing his biggest challenge yet. Terrorists hell bent on plunging the world into World War III. Please, please. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> What's the real mission? It's out on Prime Video this Friday and sees Jordan take on the role of the iconic Tom Clancy character, John Clark, an ex-Navy SEAL who's working for the CIA who uncovers an international conspiracy orchestrated by the very Russian terrorists who killed his pregnant wife. You know, the sort of standard happy secret agent stuff. And because the Jack Ryan TV series is also on Prime, alongside the likes of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and Austin Powers in Goldmember, I thought this is a perfect excuse to establish once and for all who is the greatest secret agent ever committed to celluloid. So, Helen, we're going to start with you. Mm. Who do you think is cinema's greatest secret agent and what film have you picked to represent them? Well, I'd actually gone for the one that Joe picked first, so... <laughs> <laughs> Bonus point for honesty. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do I do strongly also love the person I'm talking about who is Ethan Hunt from the Mission Impossible franchise and specifically from Rogue Nation because I think, uh, you know, as with so many things, it's number five where you really hit your stride. And uh, and this is the, the series that has been getting, I would argue, steadily better. We can argue about Mission Impossible too, but otherwise steadily better from day one. Yeah, I agree. I, I thank you already. And I'm resisting... <laughs> not giving you another bonus point and, and pissing off my co-host <laughs> because I just thank you for giving me an opportunity to discuss Mission Impossible Rogue Nation on this podcast. Yeah, so we good. know how this one's going to go. I absolutely, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> love it. No. Joe, what have you picked? Um, I've picked the secret agent who's so undercover he forgot his own identity. <laughs> and that is uh, Jason Bourne, also known as David Webb. Um, and the movie that I'm going with is The Bourne Supremacy. Why did you pick Supremacy when Ultimatum is right there? I feel like Supremacy is the movie where Jason Bourne becomes Jason Bourne, whereas in Identity, he actually doesn't know who he is. Also, there's no ultimatum in the Bourne Ultimatum, so that's got to lose its importance. <laughs> it's false advertising. Yeah. Clarice. Uh, I just went with the obvious one, <laughs> so I picked James Bond. I will that's say just somebody who got the first pick. <laughs> Well, the thing is, I'm not I'm not even that much of a Bond aficionado. I'm just obsessed with Casino Royale. What is it about Casino Royale that does it for you more than any of the other Bonds that have come before it? I think it's the the perfect balance of like the great the great storyline where there's there's like genuine tension going throughout it and it's not just like I gotta go do this thing and put this disguise on and then punch this guy in the face. <laughs> like there's, what, there's a weight the and there are stakes to it and there are such good characters because I think I'm always more attracted to like the villains and the Bond girls and I think having Vespa Lind and La Chifra are just like my two favorites. I just love them. I'd want to hang out with them even though one is a terrorist. Okay, so we have James Bond versus Jason Bourne versus Ethan Hunt, which is a movie that every 14-year-old boy wants to see. So let's talk about cast. Let's talk about Bond first. Is Daniel Craig the best Bond? Yes. It's hard because I feel like everyone is very attached to their Bond. Like mm -hmm. everyone has the Bond that they grew up with. And I, I have an, a... an affection for Pierce Brosnan. See, I also have an affection for I'm Pierce Brosnan. I'm going to co-sign that as well. Yeah. And I think the thing with Pierce Brosnan is that I don't know if the movies really lived up to him I agree. as a Bond. No one, he... no one has come close to looking more like Bond in my eyes than at the beginning <laughs> of GoldenEye when he slinks out of that bathroom door and down the stairs and he turns a corner holding the gun, just sneaking, looking just what's behind oh, it. Yeah. That to me is like, that's Bond. That's the epitome of James Bond for me. Do you not think that Bond is a bit like Batman? Like there is no canonical Bond. Bond. Mm -hmm. You can have the cheesy campy version like the sort of Adam West, Roger Moore one and you can have the ultra serious, ultra dark version and they're all kind of just James Bond. It's just pick your poison. Yeah, a little bit. It's what Ian Fleming described him as a blunt instrument, which I find interesting because in Casino Royale, that's exactly what M describes him as and that is very much like the accurate version of the character and, and I think 
the best version of the character as well because it helps you sort of <laughs> look past the problems with Bond because you go, well, actually, he's not that nice a guy. So that that's why he does all those things that we don't like him doing. Yeah, I think that Casino Royale especially gives a more sort of um, rounded look at what sort of person ends up doing this type of job and why. Yeah, and and what's interesting about Daniel Craig is that he took a lot of inspiration from, you know, when he did Munich and he was mm -hmm. researching by talking to actual secret agents and SS uh, people and and he was looking at their psychology and how they acted and the fact that every time they went into a room, they would be checking the exits and were always on edge, always ready to defend themselves. And he went, okay, I'm going to make my bond like that, which is very different from, from anything that came before. It's interesting because both Ethan Hunt and Jason Bourne have made, those franchises have made attempts to replace the stars and continue the franchise without them. And it hasn't gone down extremely well. Whereas Bond has obviously been recast and lives on forever. So I suppose there's an argument to be made that your cast is the strongest cast because you can't replace them. Yeah, I mean, I do think that's actually really important with the with the Jason Bourne, well, with the Bourne franchise that Matt Damon, like, is Jason Bourne and there's, there's no way around that. There's no other actor you can get to be him or there's no spin-off story that's going to work. Like, they tried and it didn't. So... Um, I just feel like Matt Damon embodies everything that Jason Bourne is, which is crazy because, like, me personally, I never really think of Matt Damon as, like, an action secret agent. It's interesting because, like, Matt Damon as well, like you said, he's not, like, an action star. Yeah. When he was cast as Jason Bourne, he was, like, the goodwill hunting guy. Mm. And, yeah. and then all of a sudden it was... And that's kind of why I think it works in identity is because you're not expecting this guy to be able to pull out this stuff. And it's kind of got this sort of meta... It works on that kind of level. I just feel like Matt Damon, he he just, he em super embodies who Jason Bourne is, but also has a level of vulnerability to himself with finding out some of the crimes he's done in the past mm -hmm. and even going to uh, rectify as yeah. much as he a can. Tone maybe? Yeah. yeah. I, it, it's weird because like I'm, I was watching that scene the other day yeah. where he goes to um, the girl whose parents he's killed and he just tells he tells her that that he did it because she's believed that they killed each other. Yeah. Um, and he just wanted to, I guess, relieve her of of just that. I freaking love that scene. I, I love that you have this incredible car chase all through Moscow. You've got all these police cars. You've got yeah, another assassin after him. Like it's all going crazy. And his end goal is not actually killing somebody at that point. It's not revenge. It's it's restitution of some sort. I mean, I've never seen anything like that in an action movie before or yeah. really since. Yeah, I, I think, think actually Casino Royale is the study of what type of man ends up doing this type of job. And Jason Bourne is kind of the reverse of that. It's like somebody who doesn't want to be part of this anymore and is trying to get away from it. And then you've got Ethan Hunt who just seems to love this just and just, it. It just wants to be putting his is life on the line no matter what. where he isn't smiling? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, honestly, especially in Rogue Nation, there are a lot of shots where you see him sweating it, literally and sort of, you know, emotionally sweating it. And I, th I think that's what I love about him. Like, he absolutely does love the lifestyle. He absolutely loves the challenge of it and the the sheer impossibility of it. Like, he, th he does thrive on that. That is what he wants. But at the same time, you can also see that it takes effort and it takes you know, incredible amounts of perseverance, incredible amounts of toughness and training and luck and skill and everything else. And I, I think it's that that I really, really adore in these films, partly because Tom Cruise does so much of it himself. You do see what goes into it and you see how much it takes for this to happen. And, and it isn't that this kind of magical, you know, oh, he just flicks his lighter and then everything explodes kind of a thing. You see that, oh, somebody has to develop the lighter and then they have to figure out what time to flick the light lighter and somebody has to put the explosives there. And it's it's more like a heist movie than most spy movies. It's more like an Ocean's Eleven, but they're doing that several times a movie and having several kind of Ocean's Eleven plans in motion throughout the movie, which I, I, I love. And I love that he has a team, that he's not alone wolf and he never has been his big kind of trauma was in the first movie where his entire team gets killed at once um and since then like ving rames has survived simon Pegg has survived 
And I think that's become a real part of his whole modus operandi is to keep his people safe. And that's been, that's really lovely to me because so many of these movies, I mean, the other two movies we're talking about, women die to give their leading men a reason to feel. And in this one, the leading man manages to feel even for people who are alive. And I, I think that's a kind of, a little bit more mature maybe. There's um, also something about um, the introduction of Rebecca Ferguson's yes. character in, in Rogue Nation and how it develops romantically, but very, very slow. It feels more like a sort of mutual respect and a friendship yeah. in the first one, rather than immediately, there's not there's not like a massive amount of sexual tension or anything like that. It's not really even played that way. Um, and I think that's kind of refreshing for the spy genre as well. 100%, she is absolutely his equal. And you see that in their action scenes together, that they're reading each other without really a word being exchanged. That final scene outside the Tower of London, spoiler, like. They're moving completely in concert with each other without actually having laid out a plan or, or discussed it or anything. But they just trust each other's professionalism in that scene. And, and even the scene where she first comes in and he's all tied up on the pole, um, she gives him little <laughs> tiny signs that she might be on his side. And you can see him kind of processing, like she puts a rabbit's foot uh, t on the table and he's little like, reference. okay, I, I think that might be something. And you can see their but their minds just working over time. I love it. I love mm. films about clever people she, being like, clever. She flashes with, I love when she just the opens key. her hand mm. and there's yeah. just one like minute flashes look the on key. her face. So good. Um, yeah. Although uh, my one criticism of how they... It's not Rebecca Ferguson. She's perfect in that role. But the character is very written to be woman spy. <laughs> woman spy who fights with her thighs. And she's always climbing on top of people and doing that weird... That twist. The that horror weird corona. thing that feels like it yeah, just it doesn't horror, e basically. exist in real life. Like, I don't think a woman's impulse would be like, let me squeeze this man with my thighs. Mm. I, I, I mean, look, I, my favorite Bond girl of all, all time is Xenia on a top. So <laughs> I'm yeah. here for the thigh <laughs> muscles, you know? So. I can't it was like a real thing with her that we're like that's just a fetish <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say i do think that rogue nation does have an advantage over our two movies and the fact that it came out in 2015 and that it was a bit more along the line i think we spoke on another show about in 2015 that's when you know uh, more f stronger female characters were popping up in movies so it i feel like that is that is a there was like a more of a conscious shift yeah a conscious shift right there so that's okay. Great. I mean, yeah, but like women have been around for a while. I'm, so, not, you know. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not taking a position. <laughs> I haven't women. seen them. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I was just, I was just, I no, I Joe, I'm going to give you a bonus point for trying there. Look, it's, it's a difficult thing to bring up. And uh, I, I know that uh, being a man, that when you try sometimes, you're like, I've started and I need to finish the sentence about this, but I'm not sure quite how to do it without sounding like I, I'm I didn't make patronizing or anything I like didn't that. make the movies. I was just, trying, <laughs> just, just say feminism. Feminism. Yay. Okay, I should have so just Clarissa. Did a feminism. <laughs> at the end of that first round, I'm going to give top marks to Casino Royale because I think that Daniel Craig refreshed the role more than anybody else has in a long, long time. I'm going to give it to Rogue Nation because Tom Cruise puts his life on the line yeah. and literally hung off a plane. We'll talk about memorable scenes in a moment, but he puts his life on his line on the line for my enjoyment, me particularly. And I love that so much. And just by default, Joe, you get the last point, but I do think that Matt Damon is irreplaceable and that has been proven by them trying to replace him. <laughs> it doesn't work. So at the end of that first round, Helen, you had a bonus point. I can't remember what it was for. So you've got- Oh, admiring Bourne. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, for, for doing that. Bond has three points, Ethan Hunt has three points and Jason Bourne has two points. Okay, so the next round is about your character's best film. So Helen, you've picked Rogue Nation. Why do you think that's Ethan Hunt's most memorable film? I mean, it's it's the airplane scene where they literally strapped him to a plane. I think they shot that eight, eight times. Eight times, yeah. Unbelievable. Bonus um, point for getting that right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and then, I mean, that's just that's just the sort of pre credit sting. Like that's like a five minute thing. We we don't really ever refer to it again. Then you've got the escape scene. Then you've got the break into the underground light. Well, like this is out of order. Then you've got the opera scene, then you've got the break into the underground, underwater, crazy hub 
computer Safe. thing. Yeah. It doesn't make a lick of sense. It's I don't so care. It's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. Then you've got the the car chase, bike chase. And that's just I think that might be up. one of the best motorcycle chases I've ever seen. It's in, incredible. You can feel the speed in that scene. And do you know what I love? Simon Pegg told this story at the time, but uh, he gets, you know, he's, he's gearing up for this car chase that they're doing through the streets. And he sort of goes to the stunt coordinator and goes, so so who's actually going to be driving the car? You know, like, uh, I should say hello and I sort of introduce <laughs> myself. And they, they're like, oh, no, it's, it's Tom. We yeah. don't have anyone better than Tom. He's, <laughs> he's doing all his own driving. <laughs> it's what? amazing. It's, it's amazing. Insane. Out of all the stunts, I think the best, the most memorable scene for, for me is the opera sequence. I think it's just a work of action genius. Like I think the geography of it, the choreography of it, uh, the double crossing and the, the puzzle box of mm -hmm. it, like by the end, like no, I didn't quite know what the answer was going to, how are they going to get away with this? I think all of that is really super impressive. Plus when she's I'll, got the best dress in She's got history. the best dress. I, mean, <laughs> I was, when I was rewatching Rogue Nation, I was like, this movie's actually like super mad. But then I kind of prescribed to Alex Baldwin's theory on Ethan Hunt that he's the actual issue. Like <laughs> he's actually giving them the keys to the nukes and then just stealing the nukes back. Like when I started watching the movie with that perspective, I was like, yeah, we've got to stop Ethan Hunt. Like, <laughs> Alex <laughs> Baldwin, man. And what he, I love that he calls him manifest death, like manifest he's the death. manifestation, the manifestation of, of, of destiny. destiny. Yeah. yeah, he is both like, arsonist and, <laughs> yes. and whatever. Like, Cause he is and a he's, God. And he's just saying it with his voice. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then you've got the next scene with Simon Pig and he's, He's trying to break it down to him that no, only Ethan can see the code. Only Ethan can see it. I'm just there like this is madness. I, um, I just I I don't know. I, I I kind of object to Bond being good at everything because it feels like such a kind of imperialist cliche, this sort of superior upper class Englishman being good at stuff and knowing about everything. But for some reason in Ethan Hunt and indeed in Jason Bourne, I'm totally willing to allow it. Oh, you know the traditions of this subs small obscure part of you know, the world that you're visiting. Okay, sure, I buy that. I, I absolutely accept that you would also speak this language as well as the 15 I've already heard from you. Um, I just kind of buy it in a way I don't for Bond. I don't know why. Yeah, that's interesting because we're like, with Jason Bourne, because he's lost his memory, you don't, he doesn't have to explain mm. knowing it's just in anything. There somewhere. Yeah, yeah, like the supremacy starts and Carl Irvin's character shows up, like sees him twice, and he just knows that his clothes are off, his cars are off, the way he walks is wrong, and they need to get out of there. And like, none of it needs explaining because of just who he is. But when it comes to my memorable scene, I, I already touched on it. I think it's the vulnerability that Matt Damon brings to that moment that you don't expect from a secret agent admitting to someone that they've murdered their parents. Like, yeah. you're just not gonna get that in a Mission Impossible or a James Bond movie. And seeing a character have to go through that, for me, was just like, it was just, it kind of made me like sit back and think about like, right, um, Jason Bourne is legitly like, going through a lot. Like, he's he's had an identity crisis, he's, he's loved someone, he's lost someone, and now he's just, trying to make his way back, trying to do whatever he feels like he can do is right. Like you said, it goes from a car chase into this slow four minute scene mm. of just dialogue where the girl has no clue what's going on. Like she's just come home and he's there, he's wounded and he just kind of breaks it down to her and then just kind of walks off after her. I just feel like it's a beautiful scene in a, yeah. in a movie that doesn't deserve it. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, and I think we'll get more onto this point when we talk about cultural impact because Bourne has absolutely influenced where Bond has ended up. But that type of breathing room for intimacy and, and reflecting on what has happened is absolutely in Casino Royale. Mm. Is, is that one of the memorable scenes for you when she's in the shower and he comes in and after that attack? sucks her fingers. And he sucks her fingers, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I No, I love that scene. I wasn't actually going to choose it, though. <laughs> well, well, yeah, sure. Well, I think... I'm going to choose three moments to cover them briefly that made me go, okay, I love Casino Royale. First off is in the parkour chase at the beginning. Parkour. Parkour. <laughs> With the, the creator of free running? <laughs> I think so, yeah. And and he th he tries to shoot, the bad guy tries to shoot the gun, no bullets, so he throws the gun at him. Bond catches the gun and on immediately top of crane, smacks him. the crane, by the way. Him. And he's on top of the crane. <laughs> but it's the way he grabs the gun, immediately flings it back and smacks him right in the face. Mm -hmm. There was something about that when I first watched it, I was like, 
oh, I like this Bond. <laughs> like, he plays dirty and he will throw a gun at you. It's, that catch, it's, any... it's, it's catching it like it wasn't hard. It's not, yeah. it's not like he's doing it and it's just, get, it's, just, it's just a catch. It's nothing. The thing with Daniel Craig's Bond is that he sees his body as like a weapon. <laughs> so he will just fling himself at stuff and just hope that it works out. And that's the thing. I, I agree about the other Bonds seem to be a little too good at everything. I think this Bond, not so much. Like, he makes a lot of mistakes and does really dumb things like he he loses the first hand of cards because he gets too arrogant so he's kind of a bit of a a like the himbo bond daniel <laughs> craig because <laughs> he's he's not too smart but also he comes out of the ocean in that little those speedos so he's like the sexy himbo i remember bond. that picture being absolutely everywhere, everywhere. Because it was just such a reversal of yeah. tradition to be like, look, this is the new age. Mm -hmm. We're going to make Bond sexy. <laughs> but do you not think, right, out of these three films, honestly, I feel like Bond has the weakest action. And like they have all the money in the world. Thrown you at say these films, that, but, but I think Casino Royale has like, if, if I think about like the airport, like scene that entire really? bit when Bond's chasing him through the airport and all the different layers to mm -hmm. that and then like following him on that oil tanker and ro just rolling out of the way and like the cars being blown away by the air the airplane taking off there's a lot of stuff in Casino Royale I think that you know and the free running I think that one especially but Casino Royale has a lot of good stuff but I think generally you're right so the action is weaker in Bond usually I, I feel like I, I had genuinely I, I went back and watched Casino Royale ahead of this I had completely forgotten that the airport scene ever existed mm -hmm. It was utterly excised from my mind. Not a single frame of that felt familiar. And I've seen this film more than once before. So it even that did not stand out as being anything kind of special or different or unique than I'd seen before. Yeah. Whereas like when Bourne came out, especially Supremacy, even more than Identity, like that blew everybody away, including obviously the Bond stunt coordinators and the Mission Impossible team. Like they were all like frantically taking notes, I think. <laughs> and then they oh, hired yeah. them for, right. for Quantum of Solace <laughs> and... Well, let's yeah, just not talk about that. I, let's not take away from Clarissa's point about how wonderful Casino Royale is. I, 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 I totally, you're totally right. But I think that's why I like Casino Royale because it is, it is a little bit less about the the set pieces and like there is action and there are set pieces. Like, it's like my forty five minutes of them just playing cards. Exactly, I love that. <laughs> I love it. But and they, I think that by set pieces when he's driving the car near the end and Vespa's mm -hmm. been kidnapped and he sees her on the road and he flips the car because hmm. that car flips seven times in real life and broke a world record. Yep. Because no car had flipped so many times before. <laughs> wow! But and, and, but I think that's the thing. It's like the the action is is a lot lower scale and lower stakes than than Born and Mission Impossible. But I think for me, it's it's still memorable because it's backed up by such great characters. And so also my other favorite scene is when Bond and Vespa first meet, and she <laughs> comes in the train and sits down and says. I'm the money. And every penny. Every <laughs> penny of it. <laughs> and their little interaction is just maybe one of my favorite Bond scenes, period, because the character work between them is so clever. It's so and, good. And it's this little game between two people who... How is your lamb? Skew it. <laughs> one sympathizes. <laughs> one sympathizes. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> and, and the way they try to read each other, you understand. If you had never seen a Bond movie before, I feel like watching that scene, you'd be like, oh, I really understand who Bond is and who Vesper is as well because they're, they're two fiercely intelligent people who are also very reserved and mm -hmm. really don't want to like expose themselves emotionally in any way. So they're playing this like ridiculous chessboard. And the fact that they just get to do like evaluation. massive amounts of exposition to each other. Like they just get to just go, you're this, you're this, you're this, and you're an orphan. Like they just get to just tell you all the backstory and yeah, it feels but it's like, like a an fun actual little conversation. Game. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little game. I'm a massive fan of James Bond. I should probably mention that. I should have probably mentioned that at the start, which is why like I can play this movie in my I didn't need to watch it again <laughs> before this. There's so many great character moments for him that I think Daniel Craig specifically really wanted to do. Like the reason he did Casino Royale was because in the script and in the movie, there's that line where it's shaken or stirred and he says, do I look like I give, I give a damn? Mm -hmm. Or I think he said in the script, it was, do I look like I give a fuck? Oh, wow. <laughs> and the second he read that line, he was like, That's a I'm nice in. little bonus I point fact. It. I didn't know about that. <laughs> well, that's what he said. I read an interview where yeah, that's true, he, I think. he used the, the F word. I don't know if that's what the actual script said or that's how Daniel Craig was feeling that day. 
Joe, I'm going to give you a bit more of a chance to say if there's anything else memorable about Supremacy, because I feel like we've been speaking about the other ones a bit more. <sighs> um, fight scenes, shaky cam, beating a man with a newspaper. Yes. I yes. Mean, oh, that, wow, yes. I mean, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff when we were talking about James Bond having the weakest action out of these three movies. It definitely does, because the things you remember are more about Daniel Craig's physique mm -hmm. than any set piece or him getting pumped with a defibrillator. But... Um, yeah, I think Jason Bourne, it takes that realism, like the fight in the in the apartment where he's just using anything he can and grabbing it and and just beating another human being. I feel like for me, the supremacy is where Jason Bourne realizes who he is and it's just revenge fueled and he, he's just kind of on a rampage and, I, and but it's also got like a couple of slower moments in it. So I feel like that's really the one that I, I like the most out mm. of all of them. So that's why I went with it. I feel like Bond has this kind of boom and bust cycle the whole way through it, where yeah. they, they try and like to strip it down and bring it back to basics and make it really gritty. And then they start to re gradually reintroduce the Aston Martin and the fancy yeah. suits and the fancy hotels. And, and then it gets to a point where it's ridiculous and unrecognizable again. And actually like Skyfall's kind of at the top of the arc yes. and then Spectre just like crashes down again <laughs> into ridiculousness. Uh, so they don't, they can't ever seem to develop that character coherently and give him a real emotional through line like they promised with Casino Royale. Whereas I would argue that both Bourne and Ethan Hunt have much more of a kind of consistency to them. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe leaving out Mission Impossible 2. Well, no, but I agree. I think that Bond is and always has been reactive. Mm. Bond is, Casino Royale is absolutely a response to the Bourne franchise. Yeah. And I, from the look of No Time to Die, it looks like that's a response to Mission Impossible Fallout. It looks like they're trying to go like big and stunty. I mean, it even hired the stunt coordinators from the Bourne films to do Quantum of Solace to try and make it more of a high octane, you know, um, adrenaline fueled action scene. But it just doesn't work. It, they need to, I don't know what they need to do, but they, they, <laughs> you know, Bond needs to be its own thing. And yet they always feel like they need to be like, oh, well, let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah. They, Bond just needs to be Casino Royale. <laughs> <laughs> and we just say, that's the Bond movie. Oh, I am going to give it to, I'm going to give top points to Casino Royale. I think that Casino Royale has, I think so many, and I'm going to give two points to uh, Rogue Nation and one point to Supremacy. I'm, I'm sorry to be mean, Joe, but I, I do think that Ultimatum is the better, more memorable I movie. just think Mission Impossible should have won this round. That's <laughs> do what, you? That's what I think. I just don't know, Casino I think, I think, I think that, that. I think that there's definitely an argument for it. I think that um, Casino Royale just has too many like iconic, like in the language of just cinema now, like that feels like it had more impact to me and you know there's nothing better than the bit at the end on the steps with him saying the name's bond james bond so at the end of that round james bond has six points ethan hunt has six points and jason bourne has three points now we're going to do a little bonus round something i've just come up with where you can earn some extra points it's called the agent field report and we're going to talk about how actually good your spy is at being a spy so who's got the best gadgets the best one-liners you know Who's the best at it? What makes your secret agent stand out from the other ones? My secret agent has friends. That's true. I mean, not to be all like They're my little pony. As well. they I don't want to be all my little pony about it, but like, you know, <laughs> that, that is worth something and it should count for something. Um, it, it's, it's less transactional in, in, their, in their relationships, I think, in Mission Impossible. So, yeah. My agent admitted he was wrong. That is a fantastic reason. Well done. Bonus That's point fun. immediately for Thank that. You. Yeah. Mine's got a really cool car, the Aston Martin DB5. That's true. <laughs> Who do you think has the highest body count out of these three? Who's killed the most people? Um, and obviously Bond's got 24 films. I was going to say, Hunt. Yeah. Gonna Bond say just Hunt. in general. <laughs> Ethan Hunt's caused the most deaths. I mean, look, there was that one tiny little time where he blew up the Kremlin, but I don't think we should dwell on I mean, that. I agree. You know, I, I would also say Bond, but I have to say, like, all of these films have just insane amounts of carnage thrown in and just random destruction. That that's that fight at the end, or the, the car chase at the end of Supremacy is incredibly destructive. You know, there are a whole lot of innocent people who are crashing their cars in that scene. It is not good, guys. <laughs> 
Um, These men need to be stopped. <laughs> These men need to be stopped. Alec Baldwin should stop them. That's yeah. what we need to happen. Uh, yeah, I, I think it is bo a Bond overall just because he's been around longest. So apparently, over 24 films, <laughs> this is a horrible fact, Bond has killed 597 Ew. people. Wow. By guns, hands, harpoons, electrocution... All of it. I don't know how I feel about this, Clarice, but you're going to get a bonus point for James Bond having the highest body count. Ethan Hunt yeah. has killed 75. On average, about 12 and a half per movie. I'm not sure how the half works out. <laughs> <laughs> and Bourne has only killed 27 people. He's a good guy. He's still restrained. But um, like you say, Helen, there's probably some casualties that he doesn't even know about. Or collateral even, damage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's just what it gets mean, filed underneath that. James, the collateral damage is definitely not on James Bond or Ethan Hunt's count, 100%. So I don't that's feel right. like it should count against me. But also Jason Bourne is magic because he can just teleport. <laughs> Can it, what? <laughs> well, you know when there's that thing where he goes, the bus goes by and then yeah. it's gone. Well, that like, in Identity is f so funny. Have you seen it properly when in Identity, when there's something that crosses frame and there's a little buggy, you can see Matt Damon running <laughs> beside it. You can see his, his back over the top of it. It's very funny. Okay, the final round we're doing is cultural impact. Is anybody going to try and argue that Bond doesn't have the most cultural impact. I mean, I'm going to make the case, right? I don't Go think I'm going to win, but I'm going to argue it anyway. This country is weird about Bond. Like this country is obsessed with him. And you say that him. as someone from outside the country. Yeah, because well, I'm Northern Just Irish. So observing, technically, being like, this is weird. <laughs> yeah, but this is a weird, th this fixation on who is the next Bond and what's the next Bond movie, who's the next Bond girl. It's weird, guys. And it's not something that the rest of the world has consistently shared. I, so I just feel like people are obsessed with this idea that Bond is this huge behemoth. I mean, he only just crossed a billion dollars with Skyfall. And, uh, you know, there are bigger franchises out there, guys. There are bigger deals in the world. And this kind of symbol of British imperialism, frankly, which not my words, like that's something coming from Paul Greengrass, actually, who called Bond something unrepeatable, but um, but also called an imperialist at the same time. But he is really right wing. He's really reactionary. He's really a tool of the establishment in a way that certainly Bourne is not. And to an extent, Ethan Hunt is not because Ethan Hunt's whole thing, especially in Rogue Nation, is trying to prevent, you know, global instability. So he's trying to keep things on the level. But Bond is is literally trying to prop up his own country. I do want to jump in here as well because, like, I guess I was born and raised in in England, and when you guys was talking about how much James Bond takes over the film media when it comes around, I don't feel like personally. I feel that yeah. like. I just feel like, oh, a new James Bond movie, and I see it the same way a new Mission Impossible, and the same way I see a new a new Bourne movie. Like that's that's for me and my friends, and that's why I said I feel like people outside of the industry, because I wouldn't classify myself as someone who works in the film industry and stuff like that. So I feel like it's just another movie to me. So I don't feel the pressure of oh, there's a new watch ad, there's a new car ad. It's just hey, there's another James Bond. I like. And I think like casual people who watch movies enjoy the let's pick who the next James Bond is mm -hmm. as just the same way we pick let's see who the next Batman is and let's see who like it's just a part of being a film fan. No, look, I'm not I'm not saying it's bad or wrong to to enjoy the conversation um, because it is kind of fun to speculate about all these things. And as you say, Batman's a really good comparison point. But like that doesn't usually take over the covers of newspapers, which Bond mm. absolutely does. It doesn't become a, a topic on the evening news or on the Olympics. These, yeah, or the Olympics. I mean, yeah. At yeah. the Olympics. At the Olympics. <laughs> it, it Just with is, the Queen's it, corgis. Mm -hmm. It does have a unique space. It, it really, really does. And the level, I mean, there are obviously advertising tie-ins for all sorts of huge films, you know, Happy Meals or whatever else. But Bond's level of that is on a different scale. It's very much a British institution. I guess it's interesting, like, as an American, <laughs> the the way that those films have exported it is that, like, Bond is like Mary Poppins, I feel like, in the US. It's this sort of, like, it's a quintessentially British, it's like a distillation of all things that are British. It's James Bond and, and then Mary Poppins and 
when I moved here, that's the only image I had. Of that's course. what I thought the UK was. I was really disappointed to find Everyone's out. Everyone's either a chimney sweep mm, or an assassin. <laughs> no one was having tea parties on the ceiling and I was very annoyed by that. <laughs> We've let you all down, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, that it, it's interesting because I, I agree with all the stuff you were saying about how it completely takes over everything in the UK because it's such a part of of how British people see themselves, but it's interesting that other countries look to the UK and that's also how they see, that's like how they filter British culture. It's it's through James Bond, it's through Mary Poppins, and then now Harry Potter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Those are the three things. <laughs> what about the cultural impact then of um, the Bourne films and Jason Bourne and Ethan Hunt and Mission Impossible? Because obviously Mission Impossible started out as a TV show in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So it's it's lasted pretty much as long as Bond. Uh, that's in its favor, yeah. I think. It has given us, you know, sort of catchphrases, you know, this message will self-destruct in five seconds, that kind of thing. Um, I, I'm not going to say it's it's as big in this country, but I think it's probably as big around the world. That's it's really hard to separate now from, you know, Tom Cruise. It's become his signature mm -hmm. franchise. He gets mobbed everywhere they go in the world, everywhere. There is nowhere that doesn't know about Tom Cruise and doesn't go crazy when he gets there. I think there's an, about so, as much uh, conversation going on in the film world now mm. about who the next Bond is going to be and what the next stunt that Tom Cruise yes. is going to do. <laughs> is he going to space? Right? And there's There's been reports. Yeah. I mean, because it just seems like he's been climbing steadily taller things. Yeah. So <laughs> what does yeah. he do? Like he has to go to the bottom of the Marianas Trench or the top of Everest or space, those are I, the options. Do you remember if you, go on, Chris. I would like him to fight a bear. <laughs> I just didn't see that coming. <laughs> That's the one thing he hasn't done. He hasn't I like want him to fought. go full Revenant. I want him to fight a bear and then we'll see. Then we'll win. see if Tom Cruise is really as tough as he says. I want him to, do you remember years ago, I think it was like a Red Bull thing where somebody like was like the, the top of the atmosphere and just did a big jump. Yeah. I think mm. that's what I want him to do. I genuinely think that's, Po very possible, if not probable. Well, While the first thing they did on day While one of filming seven and eight is that he drove a motorcycle off a ramp yeah. into a canyon. Yeah. Like, that's, that was day one. I mean, you just start the way you mean to go on. Yeah. You know, he's been riding around Norway on top of trains. <laughs> yeah, that was such a you great know. video of him just waving. <laughs> <laughs> so I, mean, I think I do think that's had an impact. I think even since the very first Mission Impossible, uh, Tom Cruise has got great directors. You know, you don't get like John Woo, you don't get Brian De Palma and these people just to come in and, and kind of rubber stamp your enterprise. Whereas I think Bond has a history of shying away from directors who were too powerful and too independent. Christopher Nolan and Quentin Tarantino have both expressed interest and not gotten anywhere Spielberg with Spielberg as well. Right? I mean, that's why we have Indiana Jones. Well, exactly. But, but you know, I feel like if if those three guys went to went to Tom Cruise, you know, he'd be having the conversation. Now, he is very settled in with Macquarie and they're doing incredible work, so that's okay. But they have had a very real changes in tone because they've had these incredible directors come in and do their thing, but while keeping the character consistent in a way that Bond isn't always able to do. So I, I think there's a conversation to be had, actually. I think I think Mission, Mission Impossible has been influential on the modern action movie, on the stunts we expect to see, on the level of stunts we expect to see, and on how involved we want our stars to be in doing that stuff. I think, you know, even if you look at something like John Wick, you know, when you see a star doing that, it adds something. And there is maybe a little bit more of a conversation now happening with these guys about, okay, how far, how much can I do myself? What can I do myself? How I cool think you're can right we make as this well look? About Bond steering away from, I mean, obviously Sam Mendes came in and did his best impression of someone like Christopher Nolan to do mm. that for Bond. I think that Skyfall is absolutely like him going, what if The Dark Knight was a Bond film? And then obviously it didn't work out mm. with Danny Boyle, but now Kerry Fukunaga, who yeah. I think is an interesting choice. Which, really doing True Detective. What I like about that is Daniel Craig was the one who was like, I want this guy. And getting and, Phoebe Waller-Bridge to come and do like a dialogue yeah. punch up as well. Yeah. And isn't that interesting because it's just like, Helen, you were saying with, with Tom Cruise kind of being the author of his own franchise, it seems like now, at least for this last outing, Daniel Craig has the kind of star power that he's like, okay, I want this and I want this. I think this he's the only this. Bond actor who has been a producer on the Bond movies. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, this is the thing. I think 
as much as you go, okay, well, Bond's the obvious one in terms of cultural influence. All these three films have been in constant communication with each other the whole way through. And, you know, Bond set up the template, obviously. (laughs) But then Mission Impossible and the Bourne movies have changed the direction of how Bond works. Like, for example, going towards the bigger stunts or going towards the the grittier, more down-to-earth. I mean, that's the whole reason we have Casino Royale is that they came off the back of Die Another Day, which is obviously, you know, it is what it is. Invisible cars. Invisible cars. And Diamonds Madonna, in a face. Madonna fencing. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Surfing they thought. Surfing on an iceberg. <laughs> that's what they thought Bond was at, at the moment because, you know, Bond is always just responding to the time and what they think is the best action movie for the time. Then Born Identity came out and they went, oh, mm-hmm. okay, everyone likes this now. Let's, let's shift gears and... And that's why Daniel Craig came in. I think they were probably going to continue with Pierce Brosnan, but they realized like, okay, we need to start over yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think actually Supremacy and Ultimatum are probably the most influential action movies. Well, of that era, certainly. I think they're, uh, they changed everything. They made everybody question everything. Yeah, I mean, I just feel like the major cultural impact is going to go to James Bond and Mission Impossible. But I feel like the... The Bourne has influenced action movies in this era. Like, it's not... The Bourne franchise isn't going to live past Matt Damon. They tried Jeremy Renner. Yeah, they tried the Jeremy Renner thing and it didn't work. They tried Jeremy they Renner even, in Mission as well. I mean, who hasn't? You know, he, he's probably the next Bourne. It's fine. They even tried, like, the Matt Damon and Paul Greengrass thing again and even that didn't work. Nah. So it's like, I think after Ultimatum, they kind of lost their juice with there's no story left yeah with with where it was gonna go and so i don't feel like it's gonna have a huge cultural impact but i feel like what it did for the time of what was in was change what we was doing in action movies at the time and and that change will live on through the mission impossibles and the james bonds and all that john wicks well this is it you know what i'm gonna give it's difficult because the cultural impact of bond is obviously head and shoulders above most things. But actually, I don't see it bleeding into other parts of cinema Mm. very much. Like the way that Bond movies are made doesn't influence the way other movies are made usually. Bond is usually reacting to those, right? Yeah, I mean, you can kind of make the argument that the, the way that franchises are constructed obviously have a lot, you know, they're looking to bond and the way that they can switch actors and the way that they can change the tone of the movies and in just the, how long it's been going on. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know if Marvel and DC would have committed so hard to the idea of, of this long run franchise. I mean, Marvel definitely was not looking at bond. Yeah. I I would. Maybe you can try and stretch and reach and say, yeah, that was the Batman. But But maybe not not looking at it as like, a template but like no, just to see it's possible just to be yeah no sorry that's what i meant just to be like oh okay we can make like 20 movies and people aren't gonna instantly get bored i don't even think that james bond yeah. works on that level because i agree the, the older movies are sectioned off and this, these james bond movies are for this era and these james bond mm, movies are yeah. for that era it actually but bothers that me that these daniel craig marvel ones as well no, Marvel movies is just one consistent timeline and we're yeah. going backwards yeah. and forwards and we're jumping on it. Everything it's is one connected. Yeah. Yeah, For like, now, though, they're changing things. Yeah, but like it's with, still with the, same the Bond movies, world it, the same it bothers me that these the Daniel time. Craig ones are trying to do one big story when it works. Yeah. It's like, just let yeah. him go on an adventure. I don't want to have to know what <laughs> happened in the last one. doesn't matter. We don't care about Spectre. Why, have you bring, why are you bringing this back? Like, that's what I think about No Time to Die. I mean, if the, I feel like they should yeah. just go go crazy and just have a James Bond where he finds a file and in the file is every other James Bond. Holy and, shit. And they've all just been <laughs> 007s Meta before. Bond. Yeah. That's what I want. That's what I would do, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. I that's how that's I see that franchise anyway. Like, I just think they're all just 007s that we never see their mission where they die and they get the next one in. I mean, that is that is an amazing, an amazing theory and I'd love to see... It sounds like a Christopher Nolan movie. That's why I right. like it. It sounds like... Tenants <laughs> too. I mean, that's it. It's undeniable that Bond is, is has the most cultural impact. I think I, just by default, I have to give it top marks. Um, and then I'm... Oh, I, I, but I'm annoyed with it because I don't see how it... Because I think <laughs> that Bond reacts to things. Mm, I'm going to give it top marks, but begrudgingly. And then I'm going to give it to <laughs> Bourne and Correct. then to Mission Impossible. 
I think that's okay. I think that's fair. I think that Bourne influenced most of action cinema from 2002 onwards. Um, and it's still being affected now because like we wouldn't have Batman Begins, I don't think. I think that sort of, I think Bourne was kind of the start of that grittier look on things. It felt like Bourne, then Batman Begins, then Casino Royale. So the points as they stand right now, Bond has 10 points, Ethan Hunt has seven points and Jason Bourne has six points. So now we're gonna do the IMDb round for your chosen movies. So it's Casino Royale, Bourne, Supremacy, Mission Impossible, Rogue Nation. What order do you think they're gonna land in? Casino Royale, Rogue Nation, Supremacy. That's what, that's my pick. Agree, disagree? I think Supremacy, Casino Royale, Rogue Nation. I th I think that as well. You think Supremacy is going to end up above Casino Royale on IMDb? I think maybe no yes. Uh, I think Rogue Nation's last because people have very strong views on Tom Cruise. Yep. And uh, some of which are negative. And I think Casino Royale, massive, uh, universally adored apparently in this country, but maybe not so much outside it. So probably Supremacy has the edge because no sensible person doesn't like Born Supremacy. Okay, let's find out. Alexa, tell me the IMDb rating for Mission Impossible Rogue Nation. Mission Impossible Rogue Nation has an IMDb rating of 7.4 out of 10. 7.4, that's not hard to beat. And actually lower than I was expecting it mm. to be for what an incredible movie it is. But I think you're right. I think some of the Scientology probably comes into play yeah. there. Yeah, afraid so. Alexa, tell me the IMDb rating for The Bourne Supremacy. The Bourne Supremacy has an IMDb rating of 7.7 .7 out of 10. 7.7. .7. Can Casino Royale beat that? I'm going to say Maybe? yeah. I think so. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I'm surprised it's that low. That's lower than I thought as well. Yeah, I, I think all of eight. these are a lot lower yeah. than I expected them to be. Alexa, tell me the IMDb rating for Casino Royale. Casino Royale has an IMDb rating of 8 out of 10. So it went Casino Royale with 8... Born Supremacy with 7.7 .7 and Mission Impossible 5 Rogue Nation <laughs> with 7.4, <laughs> which means that the final points are 13 points to James Bond, eight points each for Jason Bourne and Ethan Hunt, which I think is about fair. I think cinema's greatest <laughs> secret agent had to be James Bond. I don't think that there's, I don't think it would be fair for another person to come out on top, especially when I'm such a big fan of it. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and also Casino yes. Royale. This is a biased show. Yes, Casino Royale, I think, is, is Royale. just a masterpiece. So that means, Clarice, that you are the winner of the prestigious Screen Test Award. I'm going to throw it at you. <laughs> 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 Did I do Caught good? it just like Daniel Craig <laughs> on top like of that crane. Daniel Craig throwing that gun now in Now you've got to space. jump off something. <laughs> Congratulations to Mr. Bond for being awarded the highest honor of cinema's greatest secret agent. I'll stop that now. Who do you think should have won? Let us know in the comments below. And maybe John Clark will be your new favorite once you see him in the new action movie Without Remorse, which is out on Friday on Prime Video. And if you fancy binging some classic spy movies too, Prime Video has plenty to offer, including Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and Austin Powers in Gold Member. That's two. Uh, different ends of the spy spectrum there. Thank you to Helen O'Hara for joining us. And just to warn you, this video will self-destruct in 10 seconds if you don't like and subscribe. And join us next week when we're going to be undertaking an epic quest to decide the one fantasy film to rule them all with the return of the king himself, Bamalam. Goodbye. 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 <laughs>